Welcome, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of our partners here around the world. I'm very happy to be with you today. It's a winter wonderland here in Massachusetts, so I'm gonna curl up and looking forward to chatting with you for the next hour or so. My name is Lori. Um, I am a registered nurse. I am certified in ophthalmology. I work for Orbis, and I have a special interest in infection control and sterile processing. It, it's quite the uh, hot topic and very important one. So I'm glad you guys are here today with me. I'm gonna share my screen. So the first thing I wanna share with you is that I, I have no financial disclosure or any conflicts or any interest with any of the things I'm gonna show you today. There's gonna to be a lot of equipment, a lot of different supplies. I have no financial interest in any of them. This is really just a, a um, example to give you, so. These are our objectives today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the environment. That's a, a short, um, a, you know, just a few slides. The environment of which you have your sterile processing area in. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about cleaning and decontamination. We'll go into sterilization. Um, we're gonna talk about quality control and how you're testing your equipment. And we're gonna finish with storage and return to the sterile field. So let's talk a little bit about your environment first. So typically when it comes to sterile processing area, you're gonna have your dirty area, your area where you're cleaning your instruments, the area where your instruments are coming in. Um, they've just come from your operating rooms, your, um, you know, any of your procedure rooms. This is your dirty area. So in a perfect world, you wanna have a dirty area and a clean area. So you need that delineation. Um, it would be great if you had one room for each. So you've got your dirty area, then you have a, a room for your clean where you're gonna be you know, sterilizing your sterile instruments are coming out. That's not always the case. Um, that doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you just have one big room for everything. So if that's the case, then you wanna somehow separate that room however you can so that you are bringing your dirty instruments in one way, your clean instruments in another. You really shouldn't have you know, one passageway where clean and dirty are passing by each other. So somehow separate that area. If you have one part of the room that's your dirty room where you can come in with all of your dirty instruments and then another part of the room where you have your clean area where you're doing your sterilization, that's best if you don't have two separate rooms. So the temperature in your sterilization room, it can go as high as 75 degrees um, Fahrenheit, 24 Celsius. You don't wanna go any higher than that. Don't forget bugs like warm, moist environments. You wanna keep your humidity in all your work areas from 30 to 60%. Right, keep that humidity low. And, and if you have a sterile storage area, try not to you know, let that exceed over 70% um, humidity. All right, again, you wanna keep that humidity low. And let's talk a little bit about decontamination. So why do we decontaminate? Why can't we just bring our instruments from the operating room? We, you know, they're eye instruments. We can clean them on the back table and put them right into the sterilizer. Because we need to decontaminate to remove all that organic material, that blood, you've got your nucleus fragments, you're doing hydrodissection, you've got fragments that can get stuck on your instruments. You have your inorganic material, you've got your viscoelastic, you certainly have your saline salt crystals, and that collects on the surface of your instruments. It can get in the grooves, it can get in your lumens, it can get stuck on your hinges. And what that's doing is that's actually blocking the sterilizing agent. So it could be steam or gas, you know, in a steam sterilizer, the steam is what's sterilizing your instrument. If you have blood, if you've got body fluids, you've got salt crystals or viscoelastic stuck on your instruments, the steam can't penetrate that. And it can't sterilize that instrument, all right? It can't make complete contact with the surface of that instrument. So you really have to make sure that you're cleaning those instruments, you're decontaminating them, okay, prior to getting them back into the sterilizer. When do you start decontamination? So you wanna start it right away, immediately, on your back table. Don't let these items sit there and dry out, okay? Decontamination really has to start immediately during the surgical procedure. You wanna prevent that blood from drying, prevent that debris from sitting on your instrument and sitting inside your lumen, all right? And how are you gonna decontaminate them on your back table? You're gonna use your instructions for use. You're gonna hear me say this over and over again during this talk, is that your IFUs or your manufacturer's instructions. 
every instrument, every piece of equipment tells you, it comes with that little pamphlet that tells you exactly how to clean, wash, sterilize every instrument, okay? You wanna make sure what you're cleaning it with, what you're using is compatible for that instrument. So check your manufacturer's instructions. That's gonna tell you exactly what you need to do in order to clean things properly. A little bit about universe precautions, your personal protective equipment and COVID-19 seems to be a common question, of course, during these times. And really nothing has changed in terms of your sterile processing department. You're still using everything that you should have been using, which is your utility gloves, your gowns, your shoe covers, your face mask, make sure it's fluid resistant. Your eye protection, make sure you've got your goggles or your face shield. But what's really important is that when you're washing your instruments, especially when you're washing them in the water, you wanna keep them underneath the water line. Right? You don't wanna be washing them like you, you know, you're doing your washing the dishes and you're spraying everything down and there's you know, spray going everywhere. You wanna make sure that you're washing things underneath the water line or, or keep your lid on your ultrasound um, machine. Just don't let aerosol spray in the air. But otherwise, even as far as COVID-19 goes, you're still wearing your gloves, you're still wearing your masks, you're still wearing your goggles. You're doing everything that you've been doing. So there's different types of cleaning. There's manual, uh, manual and there's chemical, uh, excuse me, manual and um, using, you know, large machines, mechanical. So when you're using manual cleaning, just wipe them down using your instrument wipe or some type of moistened sponge. Just make sure you're using something that is, you know, lint free. Don't use your four by fours because little pieces of four by four, little piece of lint can come off and get on your instruments and certainly get inside the eyes. So you don't want to do that. Just use maybe an instrument wipe or something that, that has no lint. You can use a soft toothbrush in your stove processing department. Um, and I say soft because they do sell them with those really harsh metal bristles. You don't want that. You're just going to use something soft, a regular nice soft toothbrush is fine. And then with instruments with lumens, with any type of instruments with holes, you want to make sure that you're flushing them. And I'm using the word critical water. That's the new term. And all that is is treated water. That's distilled or sterile water if you have any type of filtration device. All right. So make sure you're flushing, flushing, flushing. And you want to follow that with compressed air. You don't wanna leave fluid in those lumens, okay? Because those fluids then are gonna get sterilized, brought to the next patient in the next instrument set, and that fluid is gonna get squirted out, okay? This is how we have issues. So you wanna make sure that things are flushed really well, and then you wanna follow that up with some type of compressed air, whether it's mechanical or just using a, a syringe, that's fine. And then you have your mechanical. So this is your um, sonic machines. You could have a regular, Tabletop sonic machine, you could have a large um, washer, dryer, eat, any of those is fine. Just make sure when you're choosing your detergent and your cleaning agent that it has low sudsing, low foaming, it's biodegradable, it can be easily rinsed off, non-abrasive, make sure that it can disperse organic oil and make sure that it's non-toxic. So check the manufacturer's instructions on them, check those bottles and especially make sure it's very low sudsing and low foaming. And here's your instructions for use. So make sure that cleaning solution is mixed with the measured amount of water. Please, this isn't the place that you wanna guess. All right, this is where you have to be very specific. And those instructions for use are gonna tell you exactly how many gallons per um, detergent that you need for your, for your machines. So make sure that you're using the measured amount that it's telling you. And rinse, rinse, rinse when you're done Cleaning these instruments, detergent needs to come off of these instruments. Rinse, rinse, rinse. They must be thoroughly rinsed with copious amounts of water. Okay. You can use tap water for rinsing as long as it's compatible with the instructions for use for the detergent and the equipment. Just make sure your final rinse is with critical water. Don't leave tap water on those instruments. So make sure your final, final rinse is with critical water. That's your sterile or your distilled water. Your water temperature, check your IFUs, check your manufacturer's instructions, okay? Check the detergent. It's gonna tell you exactly how hot it needs to be because if it's too hot, you're gonna have coagulation of proteins. And if it's too cold, it may not even activate the detergent. And you're just having instruments, you know, just flushing around in a bin of water. 
So just really make sure what those instructions for you should telling you and that you have the right water temperature. Now, as far as detergents go, let's talk a little bit about TAS, that nasty word, toxic anterior segment syndrome. I think we all know it's that acute, severe intraocular inflammation it can happen after anterior segment surgery. There are so many causes for this. You can see the list here. Um, you can have irrigating solutions that have an abnormal pH to them, your viscoelastics, certainly things with preservatives in them. But in those last two, inadequate sterilization of surgical instruments, especially tubing and things with lumens, inadequate flushing of instruments in between cases, which result in the buildup of viscoelastics sitting on those instruments. So we really have to make sure that we're doing a good job with cleaning these instruments and flushing these instruments, getting that detergent off there, getting these lumens cleaned out. Okay, this is where cast can become a problem. So please make sure that you're taking the time that you need to rinse, rinse, rinse and clean these instruments properly. All right, all of your little instruments that can come apart, that have these hinges, you have to really make sure that you're disassembling them you're opening them up, your needle holders, your forceps, your scissors, they have to be completely open when you're cleaning them, when you're sterilizing them, especially when you're cleaning them. You gotta get in there, you gotta get inside those jaws. But something to remember is that if an instrument comes to you disassembled and you have to put it together in order to use it, it has to be taken apart in order to clean it. You cannot leave instruments together if they're not meant to be that way. In other words, you have a new IA and your IA um, tips, your gently curved or your 45 degree angle tips, they come off so you can put a new tip on should you need it. Don't leave that tip on that IA device in the sterilizer, right? If it came to you in pieces, it gets taken apart in pieces to be cleaned. It's not meant to be cleaned and it's not meant to be sterilized with it on there. The manufacturer's instructions are going to say you have to take them apart. So it's not helping you by saving you any time by keeping things together. If it didn't come that way, it doesn't get cleaned or sterilized that way. So make sure you disassemble all of your parts, all right, before you clean them and before you sterilize them. All right, really important. No lumens and detergent. You don't want to get detergent in these lumens. I know we're flushing them. We're flushing them with copious amounts of water. So you don't want to risk getting soap, detergent, any type of um, cleaning agent inside of those lumens to, you know, have the potential of coming off in another patient or coming out and causing serious problems like TAS. So make sure you're not putting your lumens in detergent. Make sure you're just flushing them, flushing them, flushing them. Get that viscoelastic out of there, um, but just please don't put them in detergent. We also have lubricants, which are great for our instruments, okay? These, they keep your instruments healthy. You, you spend a lot of money on instruments. Instruments aren't cheap. You wanna keep them working properly. You wanna make sure that you're giving your, your surgeons instruments that are working well, your scissors, your needle holders and forceps. If you're using lubricants, they're gonna open and close really nicely. The last thing you wanna do is give a surgeon an instrument that they can't open and close. All right, the lubricant prevents the development of stiff joints and. Um, also inhibits corrosion. And they typically, you can check in manufacturers for use, typically they're dipped one by one into the lubricant. They're not really meant to be soaked, so you don't wanna just leave them there. But just make sure you dip them one by one into the lubricant and please don't put cannulas in lubricant. Don't risk getting lubricant inside of, uh, inside of your um, cannulas. Dry. Dry, 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 okay? Instruments must be dried before being stored. I mean, you, I'm, I know I've seen it, I'm sure many of you have seen instruments that look like this. That is rust that happens when instruments are put away wet or damp, it's gonna rust out, okay? Eventually, you're gonna find this type of rust. So make sure that after you've cleaned everything, if you're going to be wrapping or you're going to be storing things for a long period of time, you've got to make sure that your instruments are dry before you wrap them, before you, you know, put them out for storage, before you do anything to them that's going to keep them sitting there for a while. Please make sure that they are dried out. I'm sure we've all seen stains in our instruments. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about stains to give you an idea of what they mean. Okay, the difference between stains and rust and pitting. 
So stain is a discoloration on the instrument surface. That's really all it is. But that's different from rust. Rust can be a red, orange color on the surface of an instrument that results from oxidized, oxidation, all right? And then you have your pitting. You have erosion of an instrument's outer surface, all right? And that really can render an instrument beyond repair because these are small holes. They're deep holes. They're visible small dots that are happening on your, um, on your instruments. They can be caused by various reasons, but just know the difference between a regular stain, what's rust and what's pitting. And you can do that cost sometimes by the color. So if you've got like that brown, orangey color, um, that's possibly rust. That's when the instrument loses its finish. Um, instruments have that nice, beautiful chrome or nickel finish on them, but um, they become susceptible to rust after they've been, you know, used over and over and they've been around a long time. So it can also happen from abnormal um, pH. Neutral pH is usually six to eight. Um, and your water quality. That's why we rinse our instruments with critical water at the end. Your last rinse is with critical water. You're not leaving that saline on it. Those dark brown colors, can, that can be dried blood, and that can also be um, happening from um, high acidic detergent. And you have that blue-gray. That's typically you're going to find that on cold sterilization solutions, so just check your manufacturer's recommendations for that. Um, and then you've got your light and dark spots. So these are your water spots from, you know, inadequate drying. That's why I'm saying you really, really have to dry things really well because it can lead to rust. Now, how do we get these stains off? So you can use a non-abrasive cleaner. Um, you can use a commercial stain remover. But honestly, many stains that you have, an, an eraser works just fine. Just take that eraser and you can literally just erase some of these stains out. Um, just remember if you have more than 5% of your instruments are stained, that's a problem. And you really should be doing a quality assurance study to see what's causing it. All right. That's a great study to do. Um, so if you're finding that you have, you know, more than 5% of these instruments are, are getting stained and you're finding rust on them, then do that quality assurance study and see what's causing it so you can have a corrective action plan. And then we get into sterilization. So I focused on just the sterilization methods we see mostly here in ophthalmology. Um, that's you know our chemical, which could be liquid or gas. You can use your glute or haldehyde or your ethyl oxide, ethylene oxide, or you have your heating, which most of us are very familiar with. And this is our moist heat. So let's talk a little bit about chemical first. This is your liquid or your gas. And you know, heating really is the most reliable, it's really the most best understood method to sterilize instruments, but you can't always use heating because it can damage fiber optics, it can damage electronics, and it, it can certainly melt and you know, plastics, not all plastics can be put in the steam sterilizer. That's where you have these alternative um, sterilization methods. So your liquid sterilants, this is your glutaraldehyde. All right, and it works as a high level disinfectant and sterilizing agent. And it works just by completely immersing your items in a solution for an extended period of time. And its advantages, it's, if you're not using sterilization often, if you have a low volume center, it can be a really inexpensive option. It's really actually great for uh, lens instruments. Um, I know a lot of clinics, I have friends that work in clinics that use glutaraldehyde for their lens instruments. But it also comes with a lot of disadvantages as well. So the same properties that make it a great sterilizing agent can also make it harmful to you and I. It has toxic fumes, especially when it's heated. Um, it has this really strong odor. There really is no reliable method for monitoring the sterilization process when it comes to glutaraldehyde. Um, you definitely have the potential for contamination um, during rinsing and transferring and you really risk that um, residual solution that can be left on your instruments, which can be extremely toxic to your intraocular and extraocular tissue. And then you have um, gas. This is uh, your, e your ethyl oxide. This is your, um, your gas concentration as part of the ethyl group. You've got the gas concentration, you have your temperature, your humidity and time. These are your four really important factors when it comes to gas sterilization. Okay, the concentration of gas, the temperature, the humidity, and how long it's being sterilized for. So a typical gas load, a process starts with a preconditioning phase. It goes into the sterilization run. It goes into your post-sterilization. 
And then you have your aeration. Now, most of the newer machines and your gas machines, they do the aeration for you. That's built into the process. Some of the older machines may not have the aeration process. And then you're going to have to aerate those instruments yourself, especially, especially your tubing. So if you have a gas sterilizer that does not have an aeration process, you need to be taking those instruments out when they're done. And you need to be putting them aside for a specific amount of time. Um, manufacturer's instructions to tell you that for how long they need to sit there and aerate, especially, especially your tubing. Okay, you don't want to leave residual gas inside any tubing around your instruments. The advantages to gas <clears throat> is that it is very compatible with packing material and it can really prolong storage life. It completely permeates porous materials um, and it's very not, it's not corrosive. It doesn't damage items. But it also comes with disadvantages as well. It is very expensive to run. Typically when you're running a gas load, you need your, obviously your gas ampule, you need a humidifying chip, um, you need your uh, bug tests for each load, um, you need a dosimeter. There's, it's not just run a gas load. There's a lot of pieces to it and there's a lot of supplies and, um, and things that you need to run just one load. So it can be expensive. Um, it does require aeration. You know, gas is obviously, it's, it's a harmful substance. It can be carcinogenic and mutagenic. And it's got a low process, low, um, long, slow, excuse me, long, slow, complex process. It takes a long time, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Um, usually it's 12 hours without heavy loads or tubing. It can be up to 24 hours if you're using tubing. And in its pure form, it can be extremely flammable. But it's also a great sterilization method. I've, I've used it for years. Gosh, going on 30 years now. Never had a problem. I've never had a problem with, with gas sterilization. If it's used properly, it is a great method for sterilization, especially when you're using it on instrumentation that you want to uh, store for later use. So don't be afraid of it. Just make sure you're using properly. And now we've got what everyone knows well, and that's moist heat. This is your saturated steam under pressure. Um, so steam sterilization really is the oldest, it's the cheapest, it's the most understood method of sterilization. And basically how it works, it's a pressure cooker, all right? Moist heat kills microorganisms by causing the coagulation of proteins. And that vibration of every molecule of these bugs, of these microorganisms, that causes the splitting of the hydrogen bonds between the proteins. And then you have deaths caused by irreversible damage to that organism, to these bugs. So think about moist heat versus dry heat, okay? This is why moist heat is such a great um, sterilization process. Steam coagulates a microorganism's protein, similar to poaching an egg, all right? So you're gonna put an egg um, in boiling water, all right? Egg whites coagulate when you poach it in boiling water at 100 and, you know, 100 degrees Celsius. If you fry an egg using dry heat, that usually requires about 371 degrees Celsius and takes a lot longer. So the more moisture you have present, the more heat is carried. And that's what makes steam, you know, a really effective carrier of heat. Same thing, um, you know, think about the kitchen. All right, when you cook beef at home, it can become really tough when you put it in a covered pan. Now add a little water to the bottom of that pan and that meat's gonna become temp tender. The temperature is the same, the time of the roasting is the same, but the results are different because you used water. Now add pressure to that. By putting the same roast in a pressure cooker, you reduce that cooking time by three quarters and you still get a very tender product. So, you know, think of it in that sense. How does it work? So we have different processing um, cycles for saturated steam, right? You have gravity displacement and you have pre -vac. So we'll start with gravity displacement. Steam is pumped into a chamber containing the ambient air. Now steam is less dense than air. So it rises to the top of the chamber and eventually just displaces the air. Then the steam fills the chamber, displacing that residual air, which is then forced out to the drain at the bottom of the sterilizer. And by pushing that air out, the steam can come in contact with the load and begin to sterilize. So you have steam pumped in, steam rises, displaces the air, and then the steam contacts the load. So that's a gravity displacement cycle. Now you've got a vacuum cycle, what we call pre-vac, all right? It's a, it's a very efficient form of sterilization. It really is 
a preferred method for porous loads, things with lumens and holes, and I'll tell you why. It's equipped with a vacuum system. It starts with a series of alternating pumps, um, alternating steam pressure injections and vacuum draws, these pulses, and that dynamically removes the air from the chamber. So this allows the steam to be sucked into all those little crevices, all those lumens and holes that would normally be difficult to penetrate. Now that absence of air in the chamber allows the steam to immediately penetrate the load. And that's what makes it a more reliable form of sterilization. So you have the vacuum system, you have these pulses that removes the air, and then you have the steam that penetrates the load. So that's your vacuum. And we have our immediate use sterilization, that nasty word as well, IUSS. Um, so really IUSS is the, Definition is the shortest possible time from the item being removed from the sterilizer to the aseptic transfer on the sterile field. IUSS is not, not a bad thing per se. It's a bad thing if you use it all the time. You can't use ISS all the time, but it has its purpose, all right? It really can only be used in critical situations where there's not sufficient time to process instruments through the full terminal sterilization, dry time, and all of that. Examples. A specific instrument is needed in an emergency. You had your rep come in and brought this one instrument that you needed for surgery. You got it and you dropped it on the floor. It happens, it's, it's happened to all of us, okay? That non-replaceable instrument that's been contaminated and needs to be replaced immediately, all right? These are the, really the only reasons why we should be using IUSS. If you need to use it, it still has to be processed in the same manner that you're doing any other type of decontamination. It needs to be placed in a container intended for the cycle perimeters. I'm gonna give you a great example of that a little bit later in our talk. Use immediately. It, it, you cannot you sterilize instruments in IUSS and then store them. Cannot be used for purposes of convenience such as lack of adequate supply of instruments to meet your volume or just to push, push things along and hurry up and do as many cases as you can. All right, you, and they have to be, IUSS, has to be compatible with the instrument's IFU. When you're using immediate use sterilization, you're using a very specific sterilization process, typically a gravity displacement, um, or your whatever your sterilizer cycle has for immediate use sterilization, it has to be compatible with your instruments and it has to be compatible with the container you're putting them in. All right, and make sure if you're using IOS that you're documenting. They're actually documenting why you're using it. So you know if there's ever an issue and you have to go back, you'll know that those instruments were in sterilized through immediate use sterilization. So I'm gonna show you a little video. Um, this is just gonna recap what we just discussed. And please keep in mind, you're gonna see a lot of equipment, a lot of things. Again, I have no interest in any of them. This is just one facility. And I'm not saying you have to do it like this facility, but this is just to give you an idea. Sometimes it's best to actually watch and see the process. Um, there's a lot of ambient noise in the background because this is a working um, soil processing area, so you may need to turn your volume up a little bit. Hi everyone. I just want to recap a little bit on this first section. We're going to start with the environment. Talk a little bit about what a soil processing area should look like. Ideally, you want a, two separate rooms. You want a clean area and a dirty area. And understanding that may not always be feasible. And if you have one large room, just make sure you somehow separate it, that you have some type of delineation between clean and dirty. So you bring in your dirty instruments in one area, and you bring in our clean instruments in the other. Right now, we're going to pretend that these are our dirty instruments. I am not gowned and have proper PPE just for the sake of speaking with you, and these are not contaminated instruments. But if they were, I would have my gown, I have my eye protection, and I also have utility gloves. If you can use utility gloves in the stone processing area, that's wonderful. It, less chance of breakthrough and getting any type of needle stick injuries. If not, as long as you've got your gloves on, you have proper PPE. Your instruments are going to come out. Before you do anything, just, I want to really make sure that you understand that everything in this tray is going to get decontaminated. No longer are we using the, this section was used, this section wasn't used, so we're only going to clean what was used. Everything on this tray gets decontaminated whether it was used or not. You 
want to make sure that all of your jaws, all of your instruments that have multiple pieces get separated. So we're going to open our needle holders, we're going to make sure we open our speculums, any of our scissors, we're going to open them up, make sure that all of our jaws, all of our scissors are properly open. Anything that you have that has lumens, your phaco machine, any of your cannulas, you're going to be flushing those copious amounts of fluids. Flush, flush, flush. These cannulas have physical elastic in them. They could have nucleus material in them. So we want to make sure we're flushing really well. You could use a machine. If you don't have a machine, that's perfectly fine. You can use a syringe. Just make sure that you're flushing as well as air. So whatever you're flushing, make sure you're following with air. You're not leaving any fluid in there. And make sure that your final rinse is with treated water. Now some facilities have a large washer dryer. If not, you just have sonic machines, that's fine as well. Your instruments are going to go into your sonic machine. Just make sure that you're using sterile treated water and that your detergent is by the IFU, the um, instructions for use, and just make sure that it's measured. That you're not just pouring detergent on in there. Okay? How many gallons of water? for how much detergent that you need. Okay, this particular one, you can see it has a line here, exactly how much is needed. After your instruments have gone in your sonic machine, you're going to go to another area, rinse, 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 make sure you're getting all that detergent out, and you're going to rinse properly. And then we're going to go over and we're going to put everything together. All right. So that's just a recap of that first section. So, we're going to talk a little bit about quality control. How do we know that our machines are working properly? Or how do we know they're actually sterilizing our instruments? You can't see microorganisms with the naked eye. Okay, you can't see the bugs. Um, you can't look at an instrument and know that it's sterile. So with quality control, is it's a method to effectively monitor the parameters needed for effective sterilization. And there's three different types. You have your mechanical, your physical monitoring, you have your chemical monitoring, and you also have your biological monitoring. So let's start with mechanical. So these are your printouts, your gauges, your charts. This is a real-time evaluation of the conditions in that sterilizer resulting in a permanent record. All right, and you're measuring the time, the temperature, pressure, okay? Now, accountability. When you're sterilizing your instruments and they're ready to take out and you're looking at these gauges, you're looking at these printouts, whatever you have that's giving you that mechanical means, you need accountability. That person taking those instruments out needs to be initialing or you know, signing or something, a log book, something that's gonna tell you that that person is the one that took them out, okay? That, that, that's the person verifying that the correct parameters were met before these items were used. So initial the printout, you could have a log book with the cycle information, the person who removed the items, you just need something to be able to track. You want accountability. So you have your chemical indicators. All right, this is, where I think we're all used to these. These are your treated paper. These change color when it's exposed to a certain sterilization parameters. And they have to be used in all containers and packages inside. Just because you may have a chemical indicator in the sterilizer showing that it went through a process, how do we know that the steam or that sterilizing agent penetrated through your container, penetrated through your package? You have to place all, all packages have to have some type of indicator inside. And we're gonna go through the different types, okay? Internal chemical indicators are used to verify that the sterilizing agent reached the contents of that package. And there are different types of Chemical indicators, uh, typically type five and type six is what we use um, inside of our containers. Um, the, the determining factor in the end is steam sterilization, okay? This is, we need to determine and ensure that heat steam penetrated those instruments. So that color is gonna migrate along a path you can see here. Um, oops, sorry. So you can see here that you're going along that path and that blue went all the way to the accepting. And this is just one chemical indicator, um, but you're gonna see where that color went all the way through telling you that you know, it is accepted and it has gone through that process. 
Now, there are six types of chemical indicators, and, and one type is not better than the other. All the six types mean is they all each have a duty. They all have a job, all right? So the classification structure is just to denote the characteristics and its intended use. So you have your type one. These are just process indicators. It reacts to just only one critical process variable, typically steam. All right, it's not enough to indicate sterility on its own. It's just telling you that, that those instruments went through a steam sterilization process. I think you could literally probably hold these class ones over a pot of boiling water with that steam coming up and it would change color. It's just telling you that it's been exposed to a steam process. It has its use, but note that it only reacts to one critical process variable and it's only gonna tell you that it's been through a steam process. Type two is a very specific test. This is your Bowie Dick test, okay? This is your daily air removal. And this is what's used in pre-vacuum sterilizers because pre-vacuum uses those pulses to dynamically remove air. We have to make sure that that's working properly. And that's where the Bowie Dick test comes along. Um, it needs to verify that air removal from the autoclave chamber is working properly. It should be run as the first cycle of the day um, that the sterilizer is being used before any other instruments are set a processed. Um, give you an example. Um, you see here, you know, this, this could be a Bowie Dick test, one of the many that are out there. Um, Pre-vacuum sterilizers require that vacuum to be drawn. So, but the Bowie Dick test is going to test that. And you can see on the left, you have that an unprocessed um, slide. And that slide has all those um, lines on it. You get through a process load with the Bowie Dick test and those uniform lines, you have those beautiful uniform lines there. If you end up with lines that wiggly that are different colors that show something different or you have that big blotch in the middle, that's a fail. That means that your pulses, those vacuum draws are not working properly. And that's when you're gonna to need to have your machine looked at. Type three, that's usually um, one critical parameter and they typically, it's not, it's not meant for steam. It's typically used in things like hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. But then you get into type four. Okay, that's getting a little bit you know, tighter variables, um, and that's two or more critical variables. You get into type five, this is what we typically see um, in, in what we do here in ophthalmology, and these are your integrating indicators, and it reacts to all critical process variables, your time, your temperature, and your saturated steam. And you have type six, which has a tighter tolerance, um, and that reacts to all critical process variables. Typically, we see fives or sixes. I, I more often see fives than anything else. And we get into our bug test. These are our biological monitors. These are our self-contained spores that are inside those little vials. They're sealed in there with a growth medium. And how they work is that you expose the vial to a sterilization process. You throw it in the sterilization process. So it's throw it in the sterilizer. You usually put it somewhere that's gonna give it a good challenge. Some people even put them inside of a container, um, put it somewhere in the sterilizer that you're gonna have, a, it, it's gonna challenge it. You're gonna activate it when it's done by crushing the ampule. You're gonna allow the growth medium to create this growth environment for that bug. And then you're gonna incubate it. And by incubating it, it allows the growth of the microorganisms. Now, the incubation um, produces these acid byproducts that causes the medium to change color. Now, if you sterilized it, the spores that were exposed to the sterilization process are killed. So it's not gonna produce that acid. So there's gonna be no color change. Please be sure that when you're doing um, biological monitoring that you're always using a control because how do you know the color changed if you don't know what the color was to begin with, okay? Um, you need to have something to show that. You need to control that to compare it to. So you're gonna actually not sterilize it, okay? You're gonna take a bug that was not sterilized. You're gonna activate it incubate it and it's going to change color. You need something to show that color change. You got to see what it would actually be if it was um, an, you know, a positive test. So make sure you're always using a control um, and something to verify it with. You have times where you really need, besides every load or besides doing your daily monitoring that you really have to be um, using your biological monitoring um, and doing, um, you know, really important um, checking of your machines, all right? And these 
all of these, your sterilization installation, your sterilizer installation, relocation, when you have a malfunction or you have any major repairs, this is when you have to be doing your bug test. You can't put your machines back into use until you're doing not only your bug test, but you're also doing chemical indicators as well, okay? Really, when you have any of these important processes that are happening, any major repair, if someone comes in and does a major repair, well, great, machine's working. But before you can put that machine back into use, you really should be doing three consecutive empty steam cycles, run with a biological monitor and a chemical indicator in a good you know, test package or, or tray, give it a, a, a good challenge. And you should be doing three consecutive empty cycles with a Bowie Dick test if you're using a pre-vac sterilizer, all right? If you're using, if you have your sterilizer does both pre-vac and gravity displacement and you use both different types of uh, cycles, you need to be testing each one. So do the pre-vac and do a cycle with gravity. The sterilizer really should not be put back into use until all biological indicators are negative and the chemical indicators show a correct end response. Talk a little bit about outside testing or third-party testing. All right, these provide results from an outside source. I, I talk a little bit about this in the video I'm gonna show you in a moment. Um, but basically third-party testing is somebody else that's gonna tell you that your, um, your sterilization process and your, your bug tests um, came back negative. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that soon with record keeping as well, all right. Sterilization records are maintained um, according to your policies and procedures in your facility. But you really should be documenting the contents of each load and be able to identify the load. Sterilizer A, load number, the cycle's parameters, the operator's name or initials, and the results of your physical, your chemical, and your biological monitoring. Okay, and this is where accountability comes in. So your printouts, your gauges, things like that, that you're initialing. So example of, uh, you know, um, record keeping, you've got patient Pacheco, surgery was done on January 4th of 2022. Her instruments that she's using were sterilized in sterilizer B, load number 22. That, those records should be retrievable. So if you have an issue down the line and you have um, endophthalmitis, or you have tasks, you should be able to go back and track that Lori's case used these instruments. You should be able to see either printout or some machines have used a USB drive, um, a little key drive that contains all of um, the loads that are in there. They have load numbers, load one, two, three, or however they do it. Our facility does it by the date and the load. So it'll say, you know, um, 010422, um, A14 or anything like that. Whatever you have, just make sure that you're able to track and go back. So let's talk a little bit about that here. So with quality control comes documentation. You need to verify what you're doing. Remember, if it's not written, it didn't happen. So all these tests and everything that you're doing, we need to keep our documentation, we need to keep our paperwork so we can go back and we can show and we can validate it. This is just one example. There are very many out there. You could have just a logbook that shows the date and the tests and the results. This particular one is an envelope and it keeps everything in it. Inside, we're going to have our printouts. These are our printouts for the day. This is showing each and every load that was done in the sterilizers for the day. There are dates on here and it's going to coincide with the patient and the patient's records so that we can always go back and say, okay, this particular load, B14 at this time, and we can look at the time, we can look at the pressure, we can look at everything there was to do about that load. We're going to keep these. It's going to go inside this envelope, as well as our what we dick test is going to go inside this envelope. Everything's kept together. So we can go back and we can look and we can say, on this day, this is everything that was run for quality control, and these are the results. And don't forget about your outside testing or third-party testing, because you have a logbook that has every day and every test that you did. But when you're using something like that, who's to say you actually did it? You Really, in all honesty, you can just open a piece of paper and just keep writing everything in it. Yep, I did it all the way this week. Check, 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 everything's done. Third-party testing is somebody on the outside actually telling you that your, your equipment is working properly. Really what they do is they send you the tests. Okay? You're gonna put it in the sterilizer, you're gonna run a load, you're gonna give them all the information that they need, 
and then you're going to send it out to them, and then they're going to run it, and then they're going to send you back the results, saying that, yes, we ran the test, yes, it ran properly, and your equipment is working properly. This gives just another tool for validation. This is somebody else besides you saying that your equipment is working well. All right, before I move on, I'm just going to show you real quick. You see some incubators there. They may look familiar. Um, the one on my right is a large white one with blue on it. That's an actual incubator for bug tests that does a, um, gives you back your results in, I think it's 20 minutes, less than 30 minutes, and it's done every day. Um, minimum, minimum of biological testing should be once a week. Um, if you can, you know, every day, that's great, but you would need obviously an incubator that's going to give you those results quickly. Um, we use challenge packs. Um, and they inside of it has a bug test that has a chemical indicator that challenge test goes right into the sterilizer and it comes back with everything. You also see another um, small one there that is another incubator. That one is um, basically the bug tests that go in there are for 24 hours. Um, you get your results the next day. So just to give you an example of different different kinds. And then you have your ultrasound machine. That's another piece of equipment that has to be working properly. How do you know that your ultrasonic cleaner is actually working and that it's, it's vibrating well enough and giving you that, um, you know, giving you that motion that's gonna be cleaning your instruments. And that's where we get into cavitation testing. Uh, this is your ultrasonic cavitation testing. And all cavitation is, is the rapid creation and destruction of these vacuum bubbles or these cavities that are inside of a liquid. And these microscopic bubbles, when they're forced um, into contact with a solid surface, they collapse. And then the surrounding liquid around it, um, once the, the bubbles, once um, the liquid fills the area that the bubble once occupied, it creates the scrubbing action, all right? And that's your ultrasonic action. There's different kinds of doing them. You certainly can use a manufacturer's one. That's just one example of your sono check. Those are your vials that you put in there and it's gonna change color on you. It's gonna tell you that it's working. There's also what's called a frosted glass and you can put the frosted side inside your um, sonic machine. And basically all you do is you get it wet first. You put with a pencil, a, a big X on the frosted side, you put it in a sonic machine. And if your sonic machine is working well enough, the X actually goes away. Um, and you've got a foil test. Basically it's just that. It's a piece of foil that you're gonna put inside your sonic machine. And if those bubbles um, and those you know um, scrubbing action is working well enough, it's gonna shoot these holes right through your foil. It's going to poke holes right through it. You can see in the, the top right there. I don't have a preference to any of them. Um, I can say that the foil test, there is quite a few complaints um, and concern that after it pokes those holes through the foil, those little pieces that are now floating around inside of your sonic machine can end up in your instruments um, and your instrument trays. So just be careful with that. But this just gives you an example of all the different uh, all the different cavitation testing that you can use. Let's talk about storage. Okay, you're wrapping and um, packaging sterilized instruments for later use. You're gonna go put them away to be able to use at a later time. Peel pouches, rigid containers, wrappers. Please be sure that the sterilizer, the instruments, and the container are all compatible. I'm going to give you a quick example of, you know, um, something that I've seen happen that's a really great teaching tool. So, especially with immediate use sterilization. Instrument hits the floor. The rep brought the instrument in. The only one they had gets in the sterilization room. Patient's on the table. Instrument hits the floor. Now it has to be run by immediate use sterilization. Okay, no problem. It gets clean, processed, and gets put into a rigid container. We're going to go through that. And then that rigid container is going to go through an immediate use sterilization cycle. This is a gravity displacement cycle. Goes in, does its thing. Now it has a class one indicator on the outside. When it's done and it takes out, that class one indicator changed, that color changed because it went through a steam cycle. So the, the load was. Um, it did go through you know, a steam process. Instruments were brought into the room. Uh, rigid container opened, the scrub goes in, takes the instruments out, puts it on the back table, opens it, and the class five indicators, this is why it's so important to put it inside. 
class five indicator inside that instrument did not change. That color didn't go anywhere. It looks the exact same as it did when they put it in. Those instruments are not sterile. Why? So the reason why is because that rigid container that went in for immediate use sterilization is not validated for a gravity displacement cycle. Steam did not penetrate it. It's only validated for a pre-vac cycle. That's where you have to make sure that everything matches, that your instruments, your containers, your packaging, your cycles, everything has to be compatible. That's where your manufacturers for use are gonna come into play. So now not only do we not, not only do we have instruments that aren't sterile that we obviously can't use, but it's on our back table as well. So here we are, you know, rushing to get an instrument into the room that we need. We had to take everything down. Everything gets taken down because it's all not, it's our, you know, you have unsterile instruments sitting on an unsterile instrument sitting on your back table. So everything had to go. So that's a good teaching moment. Okay. Um, make sure that your containers, your instruments, everything is validated for the cycle that you're going to use. All right. So just make sure you're selecting your packaging according to your instruments for use. So you have your teal packages. These are small, light, you know, these are for small, lightweight instruments. Um, you need to make sure you're choosing the appropriate size. Do not shove as many instruments as you can um, inside. Lost my earplugs. Inside these packages. All right. You need to allow for um, appropriate size to allow for circulation of steam. Um, tip protectors should be used to prevent... Lawrence, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry, my earplugs fell out for a moment. Um, tip protectors really should be used to prevent, you know, um, compromising the package. All right, so make sure all of your shops um, have tip protectors on them, all right, and that they're steam permeable and they fit really loosely, I'll just make sure that you're using the appropriate size of the uh, packaging for what you're putting in there. And you have your rich containers, I've been talking a little bit about that. So these can be used as a way of um, packaging surgical instruments for future use, all right? So just check your IFUs. Say, rich containers come in all shapes and sizes and different manufacturers. Um, just like I said, confirm which sterilization process and cycles the rigid container is validated for. And you wanna match it up with the sterilization process. But these are also a great means for um, storing instruments. Um, the validation sometimes is up to 360 plus days that instruments can stay sterile inside of them. It's just according to the manufacturer's use. There's all different kinds. You wanna make sure and check and see what the uh, instructions for use say. And of course you have your wrappers, your blue wrappers. Um, they're used basically for wrapping instrument trays. Um, make sure you double wrap to provide the best barrier. Um, keep it snug, not too tight. All right, you, you know, if it's too tight, you can allow for strike through. And make sure you're using your um, indicator tape, okay, to secure the wrapping. Just be careful, a lot of the indicator tape that's out there um, can be latex based for your latex allergy patients. Labeling, so important. So your packages should be labeled for accurate identification and for tracking. So you wanna be labeling it with a sterilizer number. If you're using more than one sterilizer, um, make sure that you have a sterilizer number. If you're using more than one sterilizer, it could be anything. You could have a sterilizer A, a sterilizer B, as long as you can track it. The cycle or load number, the date of sterilization, what's in there, and then the initials of the person that is um, putting it together and processing it, all right? When you're labeling it, it should be visible. You need to use something that has non-toxic ink. All right, no chemical or toxic substances cannot be, can, are released during its use. So you can make sure you're using some type of marker that's not gonna let off a toxic um, substance. Immediately dry, waterproof, heat resistant, acid resistant. And I give you an example here. This is actually um, a Shopee, it's 13601. This is actually a great sterilization marker. If you're here in the US and you get surveyed by uh, Medicare or by your accreditation and you've got a really, really good surveyor, they're gonna ask you, how do you know um, that the ink that you're using to mark these pouches are appropriate for sterilization? Um, and these are. So it was actually a certified sterile processing um, teacher that I had once that told us that these, um, these markers are great for sterilization. They don't run, they're heat resistant. So this is just an example for you. So it's a Shopee 13601. So um, that's great for sterilizing. 
And then you got your storage. So I did see in some of the questions that came in, which by the way, were wonderful. I got some great questions and I'm hoping I'm answering all of your, um, you know, all of your questions as we're going through and we'll talk a little bit more at the end. Um, but one of the questions was how long can something stay sterile inside of a package for? Um, and basically it's event related. What that means is that once it's in there, it's gone through a sterilization process, um, all of your chemical indicators have, you know, showing um, appropriate sterilization. It can stay there for as long as it needs to, as long as that, that packaging has not been compromised. There's no holes in it. It's not crumpled up and it's, it's, it's yellow. Um, if that package stay, stays intact, the instruments inside haven't been touched. They're still sterile. So really shelf life of a packaged item depends on the quality and the integrity of the package, the storage conditions, and the amount of handling. So prior to you know, opening up a package when you have to grab the sterile package, just make sure you're looking at it, visually inspect it. First, you're gonna visually inspect and make sure that all of your indicators have changed, but you're gonna look at that package. Make sure you don't have strike through. You know, sometimes packages that have been sitting there for quite some time um, are yellow. If it's yellow, you don't want it. Throw that thing out. Um, but really, shelf life just depends on the quality of the packaging. You could have a package sit there for three months, six months, as long as it's it hasn't been tampered with and the integrity is good, you're all set. Don't use elastic bands, all right? Don't do anything that can compromise the integrity of these packages. Don't crunch or then puncture them. Don't use paper clips. Um, don't stack things really tight on top of one another. Um, stacking can result in damage of your wrapping. Do not place items on the floor. Don't put them on windowsills. Windowsills leak um, or any, other place other than a designated shelf or counter be really cognizant of where you're putting your sterile packaging. And again, talk about the tip covers. Um, just make sure they have holes in them. Um, I have seen, you know, many times um, people use tip covers that have no holes on the top of them. Okay. Um, they steam that sterilizing agent or gas has to penetrate, has to get through to those tips. So they have to have holes in them. Um, your packaging that you see here, some of them are, that they sell out there are great um, to keep your instruments safe and secure inside. You'll see those on the bottom, safe and secure um, inside your packaging. They also have indicators on them. You'll see some of the orange and the blue, um, depending on steam or gas. And that's another great indicator inside your packaging to show you that it changed color, um, that it's been, you know, it's gone through a sterilization process. So these are great to use as well. Please leave room for steam penetration. Look at all those things. This shoved in there as many as possible. And I'm gonna go through this in, in the next video to watch, but steam is your sterilizing agent or gas, okay? You need enough room for it to penetrate. You need enough room for it to, you know, to get in there and do its job. So when you place as many as you can just to get a load in, um, save time. You're not saving time because you, you're gonna find that those, process indicators inside of them may not even change because that sterilizing agent didn't make it all the way through because everything's so squished in there. So please leave room for steam penetration. All right, let's talk about that a little bit. All right, let's talk a little bit about wrapping. So there is a sort of technique here to using these wrappers. The biggest thing is you want to make sure that you're closing these wrappers so that they're flat and no air can get in. Okay. Sometimes the trick is really to stop in the middle and bring your hand out. Flat as can be. Because if you've got bubbles in here and air can get in these packages, what's inside is no longer sterile. Example is something like this. If you can see all the little bubbles here, all these little bubbles, all these creases, air can get in there and then what's inside is no longer stone. So you just want to make sure that you're flattening it and making it nice and flat. And here's an example of one that's been done. You have your indicator inside showing that what is inside has been sterilized, not just on the outside. Some of these wrappers also come with dots that are inside that changes color when it's been exposed to um, steam or gas. So you can always check for that color change as well. And what's written in here is the name of the item the date it was sterilized, the sterilizer that it was sterilized in to be able to go back and track, 
and the person's initials, so the operator's initials. Okay, make sure you're having all of those so that we can always go back and track if the case there was ever an issue. And you have your regular blue wrappers here. Okay, there's also a trick to doing these as well. You can see that they're wrapped nicely so that when you open it, you can open it in the means that you can, each piece can be opened without touching and contaminating the instrument. And then you can see also that we have the tape, and this tape changes color when it's exposed to a starlet as well. So you've got indicator tape, and you have your blue wrap. I wanted to show you this. So these are all wrapped items, let's just say, getting ready to be sterilized. Put them inside of our little tray. What is wrong with this picture? Look at all this stuff. There is a lot of instruments in here. There is a lot of wrappers in here. There is no room for steam to penetrate. Steam is what is sterilizing these instruments. Steam has to be able to get to these instruments. They have to be able to get in here. You need room. You need airflow. This is way too many. So please don't throw as many as you can in here because you don't want to run multiple loads. All right. It's not about time. It's about doing it doing it correctly. So way too many. These these particular cases have slots for a reason. Okay. Make sure you're not overdoing it and you're allowing steam penetration to get through. Okay. And we talked a little bit about rigid containers and many of them are validated for long periods of time. This has sterile instruments inside of it. This rigid container can sit on a shelf. It is locked. The key has an indicator showing it's been through the process. It has an indicator on the outside showing the operator, the date it was sterilized, the sterilization number. It's telling us what's in here. This is a FACO set. And this can sit on the shelf for instructions for use for however many, however length of time that the instructions for use tell us to. So this is another means for storage. So just little things that to keep in mind that are really important. Locks to make sure that nobody has contaminated the instruments. Making sure that you have enough space when you're sterilizing things and flow can go through and the steam can get through. Making sure that your wrappers are wrapped properly. All these things make a large difference to be sure that you're doing things correctly, efficiently, and effectively. Thank you. All right. So let's get into transportation. This is the last piece. I'm sorry I'm going a little bit over time, and we're certainly going to take some time for questions at the end as well. This is just such an important topic, and I want to be sure that you know we cover everything. So when you're transporting instruments to the sterile field, from your sterile processing area to the sterile field, they really should be transported in a means that provides adequate protection um, to avoid contamination, like a covered container, like the one I just saw you, one of the rigid containers. It doesn't have to be that. It could be something that, you know, in this is covered, um, filtered is best. Um, those containers have little filters on them. Just you don't want to be walking back and forth in and out, dirty instruments coming in and clean instruments coming in, um, you know, passing each other. Um, that goes back to your <clears throat> environment and making sure that you have a good process that those two things aren't literally walking past each other, but you need to be um, having some type of transportation flow so that your instruments, when they're coming out, um, you know, you have that flow going through and you also are keeping your instruments covered. Um, is so to keep them protected from contamination. So example, you know, that top one, obviously that one on the right is completely open. So you, you don't want to be carrying that through the, the halls and into your room, it's totally open, anything could happen. And the one on the left, you would say, oh, that's a covered one, but obviously it has holes. It has holes for steam penetration to get through there. So with those holes, that's not a covered container. Um, that too can certainly be exposed to any type of contamination. So, you know, on the bottom of some examples of rigid containers, um, these, you know, these are covered containers. So you need something to keep your instruments covered when you transport them. And when you're coming from the sterile field um, and you bring in dirty instruments, Remember, whether they're used or not, they're still considered contaminated. Everything that was on that sterile field or in surgery is contaminated. So you need to contain those instruments um, in some type of container that can identify that it's contaminated. Um, so any staff that comes into contact with it, um, you know, understands and knows um, for you know, personal protective, 
equipment on, gloves, you know, everything, and knows that those instruments that are in there are dirty and contaminated. So to give you some example, okay? Um, transport in the way to prevent contamination, spillage, damage. Container should be leak proof. It should be puncture resistant and marked with a biohazard label. There's your label. That's what's gonna tell your staff that what's in there is dirty. All this is, is a storage bin. I think it's like a Rubbermaid bin of some sort. Um, that's all this is. And that works fine. You don't need anything fancy. You don't have to go out and buy expensive containers. A storage bin, this is covered. It's leak proof. It's puncture proof. And there's a biohazard symbol on it. Works perfectly. And that's how instruments are brought out from the room to the sterile processing area. Um, you've got closed carts as well. You just, you know, any kind of bins with lids. Impermeable bags, you can use red um, biohazard bags, but please remember, if you're just using the bags, you're sticking instruments, let's say um, those instruments up there on the top left, top right, you're placing that whole bin inside of a red biohazard bag. That's not puncture proof. Those instruments can absolutely stick up and poke right through a biohazard bag. And if, if that biohazard bag's not closed and you're just putting it in there, um, it's not leak proof as well. So just please be sure um, that you're using something that is puncture proof and leak proof. Um, some people use rigid sterilization containers. The ones that come in with the sterile instruments, they may want to use the same ones to bring the dirty ones out. Just to make sure that the manufacturer's instructions say you can do that because these rigid containers have to be cleaned as well. And if you're putting dirty instruments in them, now you're going to think, how am I going to clean them? Um, you, you know, those rigid containers, some of them are huge. They're not going to fit in your sonic machine. Um, they're not going to probably fit into a washer dryer. So just really be sure that you're following manufacturer's instructions and that is validated to use for dirty instruments. Okay. Lastly, education. So please, this isn't the place where you can do, you know, see one, teach one, do one. These instruments are going to be used on patients in surgery. They need to be clean. They need to be sterile. Every patient deserves sterile instruments. And the person that's doing this, the person that's running this sterile processing department that's working in there really needs to be educated well. They need to know and understand infection control. Um, you know, it can't be, okay, just come in, just put the instruments in, press this button and you're good. All right, they need to have adequate training and make sure that the skills are verified. Um, competency training, competency verification um, related to the sterilization process, continuing education to review and update knowledge. There's so, so many things out there. Um, this talk is one of them. This is great. I'm so glad that you're here today to be listening and learning. Um, there's so many things out there where you can learn sterilization processes. Um, and make sure you're always having in-service training on any kind of new instruments or any kind of new devices that you know how to use them properly. And that is my talk. I am sorry that I went a little bit over, but I'm gonna make sure that I can get through all of our questions and answers. I wanna just throw it out there to everybody. The questions that I got prior to here when you registered were fantastic. They were excellent. And as I'm reading through them, I, I really hope that you can reach out when you have a question. That is my hope is that I hear from you, that when you have these questions and you're not sure who to ask, CyberSite, um, all the CyberSite has a great mentoring program. And it's not just for ophthalmologists, it's for nurses as well. And it's a great means for you to reach out to me and ask these questions. And you can do that through our mentoring program. Um, I think Lawrence is gonna um, put up the link on the chat so everybody can see it. Um, you just have to go in and register with, with CyberSite. It's free, just register with them. And then through there, you can get into our mentoring program and you can ask me these questions. You can say, hey, Lori, you know, um, how do I do this? Or this came about and I'm not sure about this. I would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions at all, please sign up to be, a, sign up for the mentoring program and I, I would love to help you, um, especially when you're writing policies and procedures and infection control programs, you know, things like that. So let's go through this. Um, do you recommend sterilization of intraocular lenses? If yes, which procedure? Okay. Um, IOLs, that's a tough one. Um, I have, I have myself personally have no experience in sterilizing IOLs. Um, that is manufacturer's instructions for use. IOLs is an implant, all right? When you're talking about implants, there is a very, very specific process for sterilizing implants. I have not seen IOLs reprocessed um, Typically, 
you really have to check manufacturer's instructions for use if you're gonna to try to sterilize something like IOL. So that is an implant um, that's gonna stay in someone's eyes. You have to be really um, cautious with that. Um, what are the most important measures do you perform for task prevention? Rinse, 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 rinse of your instruments, making sure that decontamination is key to preventing tasks, detergent. Detergent left on instruments, viscoelastic left on instruments, things that are left on your instruments so that the sterilization process, that sterilizing agent can't um, reach that sterilizer or you're not rinsing your lumens well enough and then those instruments get into the next patient and as soon as the surgeon hits that plunger or steps their foot in that you know, phaco handpiece, that phaco device and you know, fluid comes out or something comes out, viscoelastic or you know, something um, detergent that wasn't rinsed properly, comes out. Um, so the best way to prevent TAS is to be sure that you are rinsing and properly decontaminating your instruments. Can we use chemicals like sterilium, sterilium to sterilize instruments for outpatient minor surgeries like to laser? Only if the manufacturer's instructions tell you to do so. Sterilium, I'm not familiar with. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if sterilium is the stuff that we use, um, you know, for um, surgical scrubbing, but you don't use any, do not use any chemicals in your sterilization process unless the instructions say to do so. Specific reasons for that. A, you're going to ruin the instrument, or B, you could cause harm to the patient if it's not being used properly. So I wouldn't use any type of chemical unless the manufacturer's instructions say so. How do you label individual instruments and does that interfere with sterilization? So you're labeling the packaging is really what you're doing. Um, not necessarily labeling the individual instruments. So when you're packaging your instruments and you're putting them in those peel pouches or you're putting them in the wrappers or you're putting them in some type of container, what you're labeling is that container and you're labeling that package. And if you're using the proper ink, like I was showing you, a, a proper marker, um, it is safe to use a sterilization because it's not gonna run, it's not gonna have any chemicals. So just really please be sure that you're using the proper um, marker to be able to sterilize, um, to be able to be on your um, pouches to put in the sterilizer and it's not running. Do you have any experience of formalin used for sterilization? Do you recommend it all? I have no experience in, in, in formalin um, used for sterilization. I've, I've actually never heard of that. So again, we go back to the manufacturers of use. Um, if you're using anything for sterilization, you have to be sure that your manufacturer is validating it. But I, I have not seen that done. What is the longest time you can recommend for storage of packaging? Okay, great question. And that goes back to event related. So your packaged instruments are sterile as long as those packages remain intact and the integrity is solid. So when you're storing packaged instruments, you're looking aside, making sure that the indicator has changed. You are storing it um, somewhere safe. You're not putting it on windowsills. You're not putting it on the floor. You're not stacking things. And the integrity of that package stays, um, stays well. In other words, it doesn't have holes in them. It's not crumpled up. There's no bubbles in there. And everything inside is staying nice and safe in there. So really, your, the longest time, there really is no longest time. Many, many years ago when I started this, I think every six months we took everything off the shelf and re-sterilized them. And you look back and think, why did we do that? Those instruments are perfectly sterile in there. So it's really event related, making sure that your packages, everything in there is sterile if your packaging stays, um, stays intact. Feedback evaluation. At the end, I believe you are gonna get a survey. Um, that's gonna you know, ask you how I did and how, what you thought of this talk. And it was really helpful. Please, if you're gonna see a survey at the end, it's really gonna help me, it's gonna help Cybersight know, you know um, what topics that you like to hear. And if this was one of them that was good, if it wasn't good in any means, if you would have liked to hear um, something else that I could have added in here, that is so helpful to us. The feedback is really important. So please make sure that you're filling out those surveys. That is very helpful for us. Um, is jewelry, rings, nail polish allowed in surgery? And you saw me with jewelry and rings only because I wasn't working in a sterile environment. Um, typically, no. So here are the rules. Rings, no. Jewelry, no. Um, all, what rings and things do is they harbor microorganisms. They, they have bugs on them. So when you're opening things on your back table, let's say the, um, the circulator is opening things on the back table. When you've got jewelry and things and, and bracelets, those things can harbor microorganisms and it can, you know, that's, those things can fall on your back table. So rings is, is typically a no-no, um, especially um, bracelets. Sometimes earrings, depends. A little big hoops like I have on today, no. 
too big. Um, some facilities may allow you to wear just studs. That's okay. Um, nail polish. So the rules of nail polish is yes, you can use nail polish if it is simple nail polish. This isn't, you know, um, these aren't fake nails. These are not artificial nails because the glue and the things that can get underneath artificial nails are bad. Those can harbor microorganisms, okay? They have to be simple nail polish and it's not chipped. Nail polish has to be intact. If your nail polish is starting to chip, those chips are gonna end up on your patients. They're gonna end up in the patient's eye. They're gonna end up on your back. They could end up on the back table when you're opening things, okay? And I'm talking about circulators. When it comes to scrubs, no jewelry, nothing. Nothing on your hands, nothing on your wrist. You can't scrub jewelry. When you're scrubbing in surgery, you can't scrub jewelry, okay? Jewelry cannot be rid of those microorganisms like you're using your scrubs. So um, scrubs, definitely not. Never any jewelry for scrubs. Um, yep, rings can puncture too. Minimum form of steroids they can recommend it for tubes. Um, again, yep, gas dilation isn't, isn't found everywhere. Um, depending, it really depends on the type of tubing that you're using. Um, again, that tubing, whatever you've got, is going to have um, some type of instructions of how to sterilize it um, if it is meant for sterilization. So a lot of things aren't meant to re sterilize. Um, these are called one time use only. So, especially here in the US, we have very strict rules on reprocessing things. So if that um, type of product, like a tube or a cannula, if that, if you purchase that and the manufacturer's instructions say one time use only, you can only use them one time use, you can't reprocess them. Your instructions for use are saying that you can only use it once. So you really have to check your manufacturer's instructions that that's gonna tell you whether or not you can use that tubing. Um, and reprocess the tubing. So just check it. Um, there really isn't a standard minimum form of sterilization or minimum time for tubing. Um, just be sure you're not using immediate use sterilization or gravity displacement. I only say that because you shouldn't be using immediate use sterilization for things that have lumens and holes in them because it's just not a long enough process um, to penetrate instruments that have lumens and holes. When you're doing immediate use sterilization, they should be simple instruments, one simple solid instrument, two simple solid instruments. You can't use it for a tray of instruments. You can't use it on a tray that's stacked and you shouldn't be using it on instruments that have holes and lumens in them because it's not a good process for that. All right, so if, you're if you are sterilizing tubes, please just check with the manufacturer as to the sterilization process, what your cycle should be, what the temperature should be, um, what your pressure should be, um, what type of cycle that you should use. And I think I may have, uh, did I answer it? Oh, hold on, let's see. Do, 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 do. Where's my tubing? Okay. Um, what else would we have here? Enzymatic sprays. Um, yep, enzymatic cleaning solution spray can be used for cleaning. Yeah. So enzymatic cleaning solution sprays. So um, some of these sprays, what they're not necessarily for cleaning, so to speak, but it is used in part of the cleaning process, okay? Enzymatic sprays are typically used to keep instruments moist when they're gonna be sitting for a while and you can't get to them right away. So your instruments are coming out of the, the operating room and you may have blood on them, you may have debris on them, and that you know, sterile processing department just is not gonna be able to get to them right away and they're gonna sit there for a little while. That's where these sprays come in handy. They keep things moist. They're gonna keep those instruments moist so things don't cake on them, okay? So use your manufacturer's instructions of how you're supposed to be using them, but typically sprays are great. Those sprays are really good for keeping your instruments moist. Um, we talked about IOLs. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? How do you handle instruments that were used in the case of mitomycin C? Fantastic question. Um, so mitomycin C is a toxic chemical. Um, it is an anti neoplastic agent. This is a chemotherapy agent, okay? There are a lot of rules and I, and I would love to talk more. This, this is actually a, a whole talk all of its own on how to handle toxic chemicals in the operating room. But typically um, to give you the basics, when you're using mitomycin and you're using um, or, I, or um, um, any type of uh, anti neoplastic agent, you know, such as mitomycin C, you want to be sure that you're separating your instruments out so that the person in the sterile processing area knows that those instruments were used in, with mitomycin C. So the four steps you're gonna use in your sponges or um, you know, anything like that. Now, the key is though, um, if you're using sponges, that's a little easier to do. You can just put them aside. You don't want to mix 
your instruments that we used on a um, you know, on mitomycin with other instruments, especially during surgery. So when you're actually doing the procedure and that surgeon's gonna use that sponge and they're gonna put that mitomycin in, all right, you wanna be sure that after you get that back, it gets put aside and it's not mixed with any of the instruments that are gonna be used during the surgery, okay? You really have to be separated. When it's gonna come out to stove processing area, make sure that they know somehow you can put it in a separate tray, um, but that they know that it was used um, with a chemical. Um, just A, to make them aware that it was used as mitomycin C and B, you know, really the process is going to be the same, but they may want to sterilize. They may want to decontaminate those separately, or they may want to just separate them out from the rest of the instruments. So it's not that the process is going to be different and not be cleaning them anymore. It's just that they're going to be cleaning them separately. Okay. They're not going to be put in together. Now, some doctors are injecting um, mitomycin C. And honestly, in that case, when you're injecting um, mitomycin C into the conjunctiva, pretty much everything you're using now in that conjunctiva is going to be contaminated with mitomycin C. It's not just the forceps and not just, you know, everything that touches them. So really everything. So on that table. So you really just want to make sure you're telling your sterile processing um, department that these instruments were used in mitomycin C. Make sure that you are bagging them correctly, that they're putting them in the correct biohazard because this is an antineoplastic agent that you have the right biohazard um, container for that. Um, Sterilizing tubes. So please repeat sterilizing tubing other than gas. Oh, sorry, no problem. Um, so when you're sterilizing tubing, just make sure that you're using the instructions for use on that tubing. Not all tubing is compatible. Okay. Make sure that you're able to reprocess it. Not all instruments, not all um, supplies can be reprocessed. If it's a single use only, it's single use only. So really when you're sterilizing tubes there, I can't tell you a, a specific temperature or a specific means for doing it. It depends on the manufacturer's instructions. So make sure you're checking the instructions for that tubing and it's gonna tell you, you can sterilize this at you know, this temperature and um, you know, under a gravity displacement or under a pre-vac and it's gonna give you everything that you need to know. So make sure you're not throwing tubing in the sterilizer and just putting it under any cycle. You wanna make sure that you're doing it properly. Okay. Um, is it all right to use cut BSS tubing? Um, as a protector. So yeah, okay. So yes, I can say I've seen that many times. So one of the um, means for using as um, protectors, it really is a great means. Um, unfortunately, we can't do this here. Um, they used to years ago in the US, but um, unless that tubing said it's validated for it, but I can tell you that um, IV tubing, BSS tubing, things like that. If they are made of a plastic that is able to withstand a steam sterilization process. So check your instructions and make sure because you don't want it to melt in there. Um, but it really is a good means. You could take a, a tubing and cut it up into small pieces. Um, so you're going to put it on your forceps. So you're going to put it on your scissors. The top is going to be open because you're cutting the tubing. So the top is open. It's going to allow for steam. And it really does make for a good protector. So if you just want to really make sure that that tubing is, is able to withstand a process, either gas or steam. Um, but if it can, yeah, it really does. It does make a good, it does make a good uh, instrument protector. I think I've got to most of these. Um, and I know it's getting a little late, so I don't want to take up all of your time. Um, I'm glad I was here with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. If I didn't get into your question again, like I mentioned, um, I'm always here and I love to hear from you. So if you have questions, you'd like to be part of our mentoring, um, uh, you know, a mentoring program, please reach out. And thank you again, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful evening. Please stay safe and be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>